PYA family, how are y'all feeling? Man, man, uh, can we please uh, get a nice hand for our worship team for killing it? Can we can. You know, the idea, like, you know, these are not worship songs. These are worship prayers, and we're just singing these songs, but they're really prayers written to the sound of music. And one of the things that was said in this, I mean, this is totally off topic. Uh, one of the things that we prayed or that we sang was, God, we give you permission. Our hearts are yours. I was like, man, who am I to give God permission, right? Like, that's so arrogant. Who am I to say that? Well, it's, it's, I'm exactly a human. And, and, the, and the reality is there's certain things that God doesn't get unless I give it to him. There's like certain things. And one of those things is our worship. And another one of those things is our will. And another one of those things is our obedience. So yes, we got to give God permission because he's not going to take advantage of us against our will. So yes, God, we give you permission. Our hearts are yours because you don't get it unless I give it. And so if you are interested in giving something to God today, today's the day to give your heart. And our worship team killed it, and our tech team, and our band, and our first impressions, and they made it happen today. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you for creating an amazing environment where this, where this can happen. Anyways, my name is Kelly. Hi. Uh, if this is your first time to RPYA, I'm just as crazy as that had just happened, whatever that was. Um, and I'm the, I'm the college and young adult pastor, and I love hanging out with you guys. Thank you guys for choosing to make Sunday night the place that you want to be right here, right now in Chatsworth, worshiping God and hearing God's word. And there's two things that I, I hope that you get from today. I hope that you uh, leave with more God than you came with, leave with more Jesus than you came with, and secondly, that you feel like you belong to a family. And all the people around you with name badges, they're just doing house chores because they're part of the family, right? They're, just leave your, if you're new, leave your dish there. We're going to clean it up for you. Don't worry about throwing that away because we got you. All right. If you're sitting next to somebody, it's your first time and they're wearing a name badge. They love you already. You're accepted. In fact, right now, turn to the person next to you and give them a high five. Yes. A little bit of physical affection didn't hurt anybody. Just a little bit. Not too much. All right. So we're in a series called Soul Detox. I better get into this message before I just, <laughs> just keep preaching. We're excited about Soul Detox. Man, I, I am. I mean, I, we live in a society that's constantly detoxing their bodies. I went to Press Juicery, and I was like, man, I just need a cleanse, man. I've been eating a lot of bad food. So I drink this thing. It's like cayenne, lemon juice, pepper, and then it goes in one end, and it burns. And it burns just as much coming out the other. And it's just horrific, right? right? It's a physical detox, right? Because we care about our body, and we do things to detox our body. But the reality is... There's two parts of us. There's the eternal part of us, which is our soul, that also needs to be cleansed too. Because through life, you picked up some stuff that is kind of nasty. It's kind of like secondhand smoke. Let me tell you a little bit about my life. Um, my, my dad is a black man from Ohio. My mom is a white woman from Encino. And somehow they came together to make this beautiful chocolatey goodness. <laughs> But as amazing as this is, um, I grew up in a pretty tumultuous, like, uh, you know, like messed up home. Uh, my, my, my parents were drug addicts. Uh, my, my dad was a, literally uh, a pimp, uh, not in a good way, not in the Snoop Dogg, like glorified way, but in a, like a disgusting, gross, call the cops kind of way. And, um, and, and the cops came to my house a lot growing up. And, and my, my mom and dad, they not only sold drugs, but they were also consumers of it. And so I lived in an environment where I was inhaling, breathing, and experiencing the secondhand toxins that my parents were ingesting. Even one, one memory comes to mind is that I came out into uh, the living room area, which we, I really didn't have my own room, but, so I, I, but let's, for the sake of the story, call it my room. I came out of my room into the living room. My parents were there, and there's this white cloud of smoke that I was breathing in. Different than, like, gray smoke. But then later on, I realized this white smoke indicated crack cocaine being smoked in my house. And I was ingesting this uh, as, a, as a young boy. And as a result, I, I don't know if it's that or just other things, I ended up contracting uh, asthma. Uh, chronic asthma. In fact, I 
everywhere I go, I have to live with an inhaler every single day. I live and breathe off of a little blue into like pump, you know, as a result of the toxins that I caught from other people's decisions. Now, I understand that this is a result of, of a physical experience, that my life is affected by other people as a result of a physical experience. I caught secondhand smoke, but the truth of the matter is, is that our hearts are catching secondhand smoke from the world around us and the decisions that they make. And the, and the secondhand smoke that our hearts contract is a restless soul, a restless soul. See, our world judges your value based on what you can produce. And it causes us to be busy and spin and toil and live in chaos. And even if you're not chaotic, the people around you are. And when you try to rest your head at sleep, uh, rest your head to sleep at night, somehow our brains keep moving and our hearts won't sit still because we need to detox from the restless soul of life that we live in. Because we caught the secondhand smoke of a, of a busy world. So, the question that I want to pose to us today is, where do we find rest for our souls? Where do we find rest for our souls? I like how Solomon put it. We just got out of a series called Better Call Solomon. But, but I like how Solomon puts it in Ecclesiastes 2.22. What does a man get for all the toil and anxious striving under the sun. Even at night, his mind doesn't rest. Does that sound like anybody here? Because if so, you might need a detox from a restless soul. So how do we find rest for our restless soul? Well, before we can answer that question, you need, you need to understand one thing. Uh, there's a couple things you need to understand. Hold on. You need to understand that you're not a body with a soul. You are a soul with a body. You are a soul with a body. You are a soul with a body. See, Matthew 10, 28 expresses this. This is Jesus talking about the difference because here's the, the reality is, is that we are afraid of a lot of things. Some of us are afraid of our lives being taken from us. Some of us are afraid of being violated, right? Some of, I, have, I have unrational fears of needles. I hate needles. I won't even get, like, my blood checked. I hate them. Like, even going to Uganda was, like, a stretch. And, I, like, my wife was sitting next to me, and I was, like, trying to, like, mm. you know, like, I was trying to, like, play it cool like I'm a masculine man like my yeah go ahead ah and it's just I hate needles I hate spiders I don't even like crickets like if there's too many legs I just ah it's so bad but but most of us are afraid of something and Jesus says in Matthew 10 28 don't do not be afraid of those who can kill the body but cannot kill the soul rather be afraid of the one who can destroy the body and the soul in hell and so I'm like whoa Jesus back up man that is not PC but Jesus doesn't care right he's like a honey badger right so Jesus here is expressing that there are certain things that are, that are eternal and there are certain things that are temporal. And the t eternal things are the things that God is in charge of and the temporal things are the things that are all around us that we can see. But unfortunately, we're too concerned with what's happening on the outside than what's happening internally on the inside. We need to live an inside-out kind of life because we are souls with a body, not bodies with a soul. So it's important that we think inside out type of living because the world, listen close, the world says when things on the outside get crazy, neglect the inside. When things on the outside get crazy like a job, a boyfriend, you start worrying like, oh my gosh, is he going to still like me after I tell him this or, oh, you know, this happened and I don't know if we're going to make it. And like you just start getting crazy on the outside. Things get crazy. Uh, you, you have, you know, your car gets in a wreck or your family gets, you know, split up or you know holidays are coming you like things like that start happening we start to neglect the things on the inside we stop showing up to life group we stop memorizing bible verses we stop praying we stop fasting we stop listening and reading our, our rooted books because we neglect the inside in order to take care of the outside but the bible says 
that we need to take care of the inside because it's the inside that matters and not the outside because God is concerned with your soul when the rest of the world can care less because all they can care about is what you can produce and how much you can make for them and how much you can make for yourself. We need to live an inside-out type of life. And if it helps you to think of the movie, go ahead. Because we can't neglect the inside. In fact, when things get crazy on the outside, we need to double down on the inside. Double down on your prayer life. Double down on your fasting. Double down on your relationships with godly men and women. Right? Do not neglect the inside to take care of the outside. Do not. So in order to have a conversation about detoxing from a restless soul, you need to understand that first that you are a soul with a body. Your, your body is a house for your soul. The deepest part about you is not the fact that you are wearing awesome clothes, that you have an awesome job, that you can do amazing things. Because if all those things were gone, you would still be you. There's a book by the name of Stomping Out, by the name of, um, Stomping, Out of Stomping Out the Darkness by Neil T. Anderson. I highly recommend it. And he says this, and I'll say it too. If I were to ask you, who are you? You might say, my name's Johnny. And I would say, no, that's your name, but that's not who you are. And you'd be like, well, I'm, uh, I work at Chick-fil-A. And I'd say, no, that's where you work. That's not who you are. And you're like, uh, well, I, uh, uh, I'm an awesome snowboarder. I'm like, no, that's your hobby. That's not who you are. Because if you lost your legs, lost your job, and even lost your name, you would still be you. So we need to stop identifying ourselves based on what we can do and start identifying ourselves based on what is true. And the truth is, that you are a new creation in Christ Jesus, operative word, in Christ Jesus, that God set you apart, and then God made you, and he doesn't make junk, that he is a king, and he deemed you his child, and given you access to the throne. He's given you an inheritance when you didn't have an inheritance. Like, there's so much more to you than what you attribute to yourself sometimes. So in order for us to have this conversation over the next four weeks, we need to understand that we're souls with a body, not bodies with a soul. So where do we find rest for our souls? Very simple sermon today. Where do we find rests for our souls? Well, first, we start by setting an alarm. Setting an alarm. Setting an alarm. Anybody set alarms? Okay, anybody does? Uh, How many of you are snooze button people? Yeah, my wife is a snooze button people. Uh, <clears throat> she is literally, she's got great intentions. So she's like all, like the night before, she's like super ambitious. She's like, I'm setting my alarm for 6 a.m. I'm like, sure, honey, go do it. And um, <laughs> I'm like, you already know how this is going to end. And so do I. <clears throat> so 6 a.m. happens. Bing, I'm up. Her alarm's going. She's, of course, hits the snooze button. All right, I go up and I do my thing. And, like, literally, you know how snooze buttons work, right? Yeah. Like, every 15 minutes, it's just like, bring, and then you're like, uh-huh, right? And it's like the worst possible sleep you can ever give yourself. This would be waking up every 15 minutes. So, anyways, this goes on for Michelle for two and a half hours. <laughs> Six o'clock to 8.30. Oh, my God. Right? I'm like, how, why are you, you are a glutton for punishment, my, my sweet honey buns. Like, why would you do that to yourself? It's just relentless. It's the worst thing you could do. Like, I don't know. I don't get it, but she does. And my job is to empathize. It's all good, sweetheart. I learned that in counseling last week. Thank you. Where was I? Oh yeah. Alarm. Um, do you know, um, there's another type of alarm you set. You, there's another type of alarm that you want to set is the kind of alarm that you set when you're trying to protect something valuable, right? When, you're, when you have valuable things, like you might have like valuable stuff. I don't know. I'm not at that level yet. But you might have some valuable things like diamonds <laughs> or, you know, or guns or whatever. Uh, you set an alarm. You don't want people stealing your guns or your diamonds. I should have thought that one through. Um, but you set an alarm when you have valuable things. And, the, and one of the most valuable things that you have is, is, is peace. 
is peace, especially if you are a Jesus follower because Jesus is called the Prince of Peace, right? And if you're not experiencing peace, somebody's trying to steal it. Well, let me tell you who's trying to steal it. Okay, let me, let me tell you. John 10.10. 10. John 10.10 10 says this, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. This is Jesus telling you about a thief that is coming to steal, kill, and destroy. And Jesus contrasts himself by saying, but I have come that they may have life and life to abundance. Right? So God has this plan to give you an abundant life. But the reason why you're not experiencing it is because you are interacting with a thief somehow, right? That is trying to steal, kill, and destroy you. Like literally, if you think about it, that's like somebody coming into your house, stealing something very valuable like your diamonds, and then trashing your house and breaking things and pushing things over, and then on the way out, they just shoot you in the head, right? Steal, kill, and destroy. Now notice the operative word here, thief. You know the difference between a thief and a robber? See, a robber steals through force, but a thief steals through deception. And so if the enemy can get you to believe that you are worth nothing unless you produce, unless you are busy, unless whatever, like he, he might even fool you into thinking being still and being quiet before the Lord is lazy. And if he can get you to believe that, he gets to steal your peace. So the only way to get around that is setting an alarm. Setting an alarm. Setting an alarm. So where do we find our peace? First, we need to understand that we're souls wrapped in flesh. And then the next thing you need to know is that we need to set an alarm and prioritize the things that are important. Prioritize the things. That's what setting an alarm does. Don't let your feet touch the ground without acknowledging who gave you the air that you're breathing. Point two, be still. Point two, be still. So point one, really, essentially, is set an alarm. Point two is be still. All right, I know that your notes may not reflect that, but I want you to understand that's what I want you to take away today. Set an alarm, be still. See, our hearts have ADHD. We do. Does anybody know what ADHD is? All right, cool. I'll tell you for the rest of you guys, you're looking at the quintessential definition of ADHD. Like, if you look up ADHD, you will see an eight-year-old picture of me running this way or running this way. Uh, and it'll be blurred out uh, because they can't catch me. Um, <laughs> can't. I won't let them do it. So ADHD is like a superpower. It, you know, uh, it's kind of like the idea is, is that you have the ability to focus on everything at the same time and yet do none of it well, right? <laughs> it's, it's amazing, Right? And that's exactly what your heart is doing. It's constantly focusing on other things, and you have to tell it what to do and what not to do. And King David understood this battle that was happening within himself. And that's why he says in Psalm 46:10, be still and know that he is God. He said, Soul, stop it, be still. (laughs) That's what I heard when I was eight years old. Stop fidgeting. Sit there, be still. And know that he's God. When my wife um, was uh, learning about me, uh, this was also one of the liabilities she had to accept. And so what she did before we started dating is she asked one of her roommates, hey, uh, Misty was her name, or is her name. She's still with us. Uh, (laughs) Misty, tell me about Kelly. And she's like, Man, Kelly's a great guy, you know, he loves God, he's in seminary, he wants to be a pastor, a lot of great things, but, you know, I hope you can handle a lot of fidgeting, tapping, clicking, just any kind of noise that he will make, he will make it, and he doesn't stop, and and Michelle eventually had, you know, she overlooked that uh, liability, and I appreciate that. Um, 
I well, I don't really appreciate it. Um, it. Sometimes when we're in movies, and I don't even know that I'm doing this, and it's just the leg is just going, and then all of a sudden I feel two fingers, bam, <laughs> and I'm like, ah, uh-huh, yeah, I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then it's the other leg, <laughs> and then it's just two fingers, and she doesn't even have to touch that leg. I already know it's just bam right there. Like, dang it, I did it again. So I don't even know what's happening sometimes. I just got this nervous energy that lives within me. And uh, the same is true with your heart. It's just like that. And unless you tell it to be still, it won't. It will not be still. See, David knew this, and he, he obviously wrote many psalms. That wasn't the only verse in the Bible, by the way, where David says, be still. In fact, there are three different ways David stood before the Lord and stilled his heart. There's three different ways. So you want to write this down, you should, and it's going to come at you fast. So three different ways David found rest. The first way was he was still. Okay? Okay. Psalm 131, too, says, I quieted my soul. I quieted my soul. I quieted my soul. Wait, hold on. Did God quiet his soul? No. David did. So if you want a still heart, don't wait for somebody. Don't wait for the circumstances to be perfect. Don't wait for it not to rain. Don't wait for you not to be tired. Just do it. I quieted my soul. He took responsibility and quieted his soul before the Lord. The second thing that he did, he waited for the Lord. Waited for the Lord. Psalm 37, 7 says, be still and wait for him. Wait for him. That is so hard. We live in such an instant society. Instant society. Patience is not characteristic of this generation. In fact, we are considered one of the most impatient ungrateful generations that has ever graced this earth. So much so that even when talking about telephones, like in my day, when I had to make a phone call, um, I had to use a rotary phone that I had to like have ones and zeros that had to go around and I had to physically like wretch that thing around and there were sparks and clicks and it somehow made it over to somebody and hopefully they were home at the right time because if not, they had to like, I had to leave a voicemail and if they got the voicemail, they would have to find a time to call me back and if we couldn't find times, we had these little pagers that we can like link times and, and if you don't know where the pager is, it's kind of like a calculator that talks to other calculators, and all you can do is communicate numbers. It sucked. Um, But now, like when you want to send a selfie to somebody in Florida, like you're like, did you get it? Did you get it yet? Within a minute, within a, not even a minute, within a second, right? You're not even thinking that that image has to go to space first. (laughs) Has to swirl around some sort of thingy and come back down, hit their phone, and they have to like it for you to know that they got it, so they have to send another message back. That's amazing. You should be like, whoa, every time you use your phone, you should be like, that's amazing. Right? But the reason why we don't, because we forget. We forget that waiting, being still, is something that's taken for granted. And when it comes to talking to God, when it, talk, when it comes to whatever season in your life, you might be in a waiting period and you're not used to it because we live in such an instant society. You might be waiting two years, three years for that boyfriend, for that girlfriend, for that job, for that opportunity. But God's trying to reveal himself in the waiting. Psalm 130, five through six says, my soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman waits for the morning. Doesn't that sound beautiful? My soul waits for the Lord. Maybe your soul needs to wait for the Lord and not wait for that job anymore. Maybe your soul needs to wait for the Lord and not wait for that person. Maybe your soul needs to wait for the Lord just in this season. And until your soul is waiting for the Lord more than a watchman waits over a city gate. You know what a watchman is? A watchman is somebody who literally protects, like, the kingdom. 
and they stay up all night seeing if there's any enemies coming. And they're waiting for the sun to rise because at that point, they can switch shifts for the next watchman or watchwoman. Right? And his soul, David's saying, my soul waits for the Lord more than, more than a watchman on duty is waiting and watching the horizon to see if the sun is coming up or if an enemy is coming. Is that you? If not, take some time to wait on the Lord. The third way that David found rest, the third way. So the first one was be still. The second one was waiting for the Lord. And the third one was reflecting on God's goodness. This is a good one. This is a good one because oftentimes we, we come into God's presence and we're so focused on what God can give us, but we forget what God has done for us, right? And every once in a while, we just need to look back and say, thank you. That was amazing. I can't believe it. And I got a cell phone with pictures of my friends in it. Um, it's kind of awesome. And, and David says here, Psalm 16, Psalm 116, 7 through 9. Be at rest, my soul. Oh, I love it. He starts it over again, man. He's preaching to me. Be at rest, O oh my soul. For the Lord God has been good to you. For you, O oh Lord, has delivered my soul from death. He's preaching to his soul. Have you thought about that? That you need to tell your soul to be still? And let me tell you what to think. Be at rest, O oh, oh my soul, for the Lord God has been good to you. For you, O oh Lord, has, has, has delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, and my feet from stumbling. In whatever season of life, maybe, maybe you just need to reflect on God's goodness. And you, maybe you need to wake up tomorrow and just thank God that he's answered prayers. And maybe you need to wake up tomorrow and thank God that Jesus died the death that you deserve so that you can live the life that you could not live. And maybe tomorrow you need to wake up and you need to thank God that he's working all things for your good because you love him. Maybe tomorrow you need to wake up and thank God for blessing you with a hope and a future because he has plans to give you that hope and plans to give you that future and plans not to harm you, but to make you prosper. And maybe today, right now, in this place, we need to thank God. When you reflect on God's goodness, your soul finds rest. And when you, here's a, here's a trippy thing. If you say it out loud, it changes everything because you cannot say and think something at the same time. You can't say, thank you, God, and think, oh, my gosh, my bills, right? You can just thank you, God, that I have a car, that I have a house, that it's raining outside and rain is not falling on my head, right? It's hard to say that out loud and talk, say something, and think something else. So you can actually talk yourself out of a bad mood. So where do we find rest for our souls? We be still. We set an alarm. Be still. Set an alarm. Crazy thing about setting an alarm, um, I, uh, I, uh, I used to run a, D well, I still run a DJ company, but I used to go on tour with a lot of celebrities, Luke Bryan, uh, Pitbull, Lenny Kravitz, Warm Republic, you know, CeeLo Green, all those guys. And, um, and I made friends with a lot of these guys, and when they found out that I was, like, going into ministry, that this was not my thing. Like, I'm not trying to become famous. I'm actually just using this <laughs> to pay for school. Um, and they, 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 you know, became friends with me and they liked my story and they actually gave me access to places that I never thought I would get access to. Go figure. Um, and uh, one day, my wife and I, we were walking to uh, the mailbox and she pulls out an envelope with my name on it. And I was like, well, this is, I don't really get a whole lot of mail and said, you know, to Mr. McCoy. And so I open it up and it's a really nice, like, letter and I realize that this is an invitation and I'm reading the invitation and I realize I'm being invited to the White House for a pastor's breakfast. I was like, you gotta be kidding me. I'm gonna see the first black president of the United States. I'm going to meet the most powerful man in the free world. I can't believe this. And so the only catch was I had to, you know, uh, catch my own flight and get my own accommodation. So I was like, deal. So my wife and I, we fly out to Washington, we get an Airbnb, and uh, the breakfast is at eight o'clock, so I know that I need to be, you know, 
up at six, out the door by seven, because security is gonna happen, you know. I, so it took me 30 minutes to get to the house, and then 30 minutes for security, and then finally, I'm eating waffles with Obama. All right. <laughs> so I'm so giddy. Like, I am super giddy as a schoolgirl. Like, I don't know what schoolgirls are when they're giddy, but that's me. The night before, and I'm like up until 4 a.m., and I finally fall asleep. And it seemed like, it seemed like a, like a second went by. And then all of a sudden I hear a do, 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 do on the door. I wake up and it's Michelle. And she's like, she's like, Kelly, it's 10 o'clock. You forgot to set your alarm. You didn't wake up. And that story is absolutely not true. However, <laughs> however, what is true, what is true, <laughs> what is true is that um, I have been invited by the most important person in the universe every single day. He's the King of Kings and He is the Lord of Lords. And he's invited me into his presence. And that appointment does not happen unless I set an alarm. Amen. So if you want rest for your souls, you will need to set an alarm. The second thing you'll need to do is be still. It's a simple sermon. You know, my, my dog, Mr. Snuffy, you, of course you do. Um, <laughs> here's a picture in case you don't remember what it looks like. Yeah. Um, Mr. Snuffy, he, he's got the opposite of being cross-eyed. He's wide-eyed, so he's got, like, GoPro vision, so nothing, nothing really sneaks up on him because he, he's, like, he's like Google Maps, you know? Just swipe. All right, we're good. Um, and so Mr. Snuffy, he, like, the fulfillment every morning, he, like, like, he doesn't, he's not allowed to jump on the bed, so he jumps, like, as close to the possible. He's like, eh. And his legs are too long, so he can't really jump up. He always needs help because I have, like, a hardwood floor, so, like, every time he jumps, he, like, slips. Uh, so it's actually really fun to watch. But he cannot wait to go outside. He cannot wait. Every morning, he, like, his heart's desire is to run free and smell all the trees he wants. But he cannot go outside without a leash because I'm afraid that another dog much bigger than him will eat him, <laughs> right? I'm also afraid that he might get spooked and run into traffic, right? So I'm afraid of those things. So I want him to go outside. I want him to experience the fullness of the bright Monday morning, or if it's Michelle, afternoon. I want him to experience that, but he cannot do that without a leash. And in order for me to take him out, he needs to what? Be still. And we have a, we have a vision statement at Rocky Peak to create a movement of passionate Christ followers who are unleashed, unleashed, who are serving sacrificially, loving God, who are pursuing God, loving people, and sharing Christ. And, and in order for you to be unleashed, you need to put a leash on that soul of yours because it will not be still unless you tell it to. So set an alarm. Be still. Let's get the band up. It's time for us to be still. I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that tonight, actually. God does not want us to be riled up on the inside God wants to deliver us from the restless chaos that exists in the world around us. And remind you, let me remind you, you can be very busy and yet experience peace because you're a soul with a body. And you can set an alarm and you can be still. So what I want you to do is this. Every day, I want you to take this challenge. It's called the five-minute challenge. And what I do in this five-minute challenge 
I wake up and uh, I do what I, I do physically what I want my heart to do. So I get on my knees, All right? Nothing uber spiritual about that. I'm just reflecting what I want my heart to do. I get on my knees. And then I do not pray. I do not ask God for stuff. I do not talk to God about what I'm worried about because that's another part of my prayer. I'm not saying you don't pray those things. I'm just saying in the five-minute challenge, all you're doing is telling your heart to be still. Oh, first thing I do is set an alarm and I do not hit the snooze button. And, and when, when, I, when I sense that my heart wants to go different places and starts to think about old relationships or relationships that I want or the things that I have to do or even my first meeting or an email that I got yesterday or the expectations of my friends and family and my heart starts going there and I say, be still. And I start to quote the, the 23rd Psalm. Does anybody know what the 23rd Psalm says? It says, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And for some reason, that, that clears my soul so that I can experience the Prince of Peace. And if you're a believer in Christ Jesus, you need to be experiencing this peace. And if you're not experiencing this peace, you need to tell your heart to be still. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The Lord leads me beside still waters. He makes me lie down in green pastures. And I just stop there. And just say, still waters, green pastures. Still waters, green pastures. And when I do this, it's a five-minute challenge. So I set my alarm for five minutes. And I just sit there. Still waters, green pastures. Still waters, green pastures. And maybe you're here today and you don't know where to go. You don't know what to do. But you have a restless heart. And maybe you need to know that Jesus is, is inviting you. In Matthew 11, he says, come to me. Come to me all you who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. Not for your bodies, but for your souls. Will you take the five minute challenge this week and will you find peace in the midst of a restless society and you can choose to set an alarm and be still. Let's pray. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He lies me down in green pastures. He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. Lord, may your children be refreshed in being still in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen.